All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about hardening and softening materials, Parker's postulates, and that'll lead us into the normality flow rule for this video. Some of this discussion uh, comes from a book called Plasticity Theory by Jacob Lubliner. I'll kind of bring that over here real quick. Um, this is a nice reference. It's uh, fairly inexpensive. You might even be able to find a PDF on the web somewhere. And um, I probably agree with some of the reviews that it's got on uh, Amazon that may, maybe not the first book you'd want to read in plasticity theory, but it is a, a nice reference. So we finished up uh, with previous videos, videos talking about yield criteria and so forth. Let's kind of uh, talk a little bit about the difference between hardening materials and softening materials, and we'll get into some implications of that through Ducker's postulates that will lead us to something called the normality flow rule, which will be an important consequence for us as we develop our yield surface plasticity theories. So I'm going to label this uh, section D. Um, it may or may not follow from C from the last lecture, but, but I'm going to label it this way as that's what I have in my notes. Um, I have a little bit more flexibility to drag and drop lectures in different orders in the playlist, so uh, don't worry if you didn't see item C. All right, so this will be hardening and softening. All right, so when we do a, a test in the lab, and we construct our true stress strain curve. And we've talked about uh, constructing our true stress strain curves and so forth. You might get a shape for a metal or, or a particular material that kind of goes up like this. It's a peak. And some materials can actually soften. And on their true stress strain curves, this can actually decrease a little bit. Now, necessarily, this test must be in displacement control in order for us to have a drop in load. Most metals will not exhibit a softening range, but under certain conditions you may have materials that do. So we're going to talk about this in a, in a fairly general sense. So this point from this ultimate over this way, where the slope is increasing, this would be our hardening portion of the curve, and over to where the slope is decreasing from the ultimate, that would be the softening part of the curve. And again, we're talking about a uniaxial tensile test. We can expand some of these ideas to the multiaxial sense as well. All right, so let me write a couple notes off to the side, and I'll pause the video for just a second. All right, so those are just some notes there. Um, pretty much what I had just said. Now right now this curve is in stress versus total strain, which includes the elastic and plastic parts of the strain. If we decompose this stress strain curve into the uh, elastic and plastic parts of the strain and look at the stress versus plastic strain, we can get a kind of a similar looking figure uh, that I'll draw here on the next page. All right. So here's our stress versus plastic strain curve. We're starting up at some stress level to represent our yield stress, below which we don't really have any appreciable elastic strain. We have a hardening portion. We have kind of a, a large flat portion that I've drawn here, mainly uh, to make the sketch uh, that I, to look like what I want it to look like. And then we have a softening region over on the right-hand side. Now we need to note that in all of these, we are in strain control and we're increasing the plastic strains. And for all of these, d epsilon p is greater than zero. So we're continuing to stretch out the material uh, with permanent deformation. But here in this first bit, we can see that we have stress that is rising. So our stress increment, d sigma, would be greater than zero. In this flat portion, we have no change in stress, even though we have an increase in strain. So our d sigma would be equal to zero. And then over here, our stress is decreasing even though we have an increase in strain. So in this case, our d sigma would be less than zero.
And again, just to emphasize uh, what I'm trying to show here is that we're in a uniaxial type situation. All right, so if we think about this, we can define whether or not we have a softening or hardening or stable material based on the product of the plastic strain increment and the stress increment. All right, so if we look at these products, we have D sigma D epsilon P you can take one of three situations. We can have this greater than zero, or I guess greater than or equal to zero. That would be in our hardening region. We can be exactly equal to zero, which would be perfectly plastic. Or we can be less than or equal to zero, which would put us in our softening region. And this, this measure here, the product of these increments of uh, stress and plastic strain, you may know from uh, undergraduate mechanics materials, that's an energy density measure. It could be the area underneath of the curve. Uh, you may have some constants in front of it. But taken uh, as a product of some sort of load and some sort of displacement term, divided by area and divided by original length, gives us an energy density type measure. So that's another way that we're going to end up looking at this is in terms of energy and work. And that will lead us into our Drucker's postulate for work hardening materials. Uh, now, uh, Daniel Drucker was a professor at Brown University. He went to the University of Florida later in his career. Colleague of mine, um, Paul Hubner, uh, had an office next to him when he was a, an emeritus professor. And uh, Paul was a, uh, a postdoc, a research engineer. And um, he was also, uh, I believe, a dean at the University of Illinois, so my alma mater. He's done a lot for the theory of plasticity. Um, and uh, there was a very active group at Brown University around that time that that established some of the very early fundamentals of plasticity and, and how it's used today. So I think you'll see that name in, uh, in that uh, university come up a lot um, if you do a little bit of reading in plasticity theory. All right, now I'll give kind of a short version of, of Drucker's postulate. Um, I would encourage you as the listener to find the original papers and look at the details uh, uh, more precisely for Drucker's postulate for work hardening materials. But we're going to start off with a state of stress, plastic and elastic strain, that compose the current state of a material that I have shown here. And with that current state, I'm going to add an additional stress increment, plastic strain increment, and elastic strain increment on top of it. And uh, using the quote here, applied by an external agency. So then, if we look at the product, d sigma d epsilon, okay, now this is the total strain, which would be equal to d sigma d epsilon elastic plus d epsilon plastic. And this would be the work performed by the external agency during loading. <coughs> 
And if we were to do a complete load and unload cycle, the elastic strains would be recovered, but the plastic strains would not. So then d sigma d epsilon p would be the uh, work performed during a complete loading and unloading cycle. Now, since d sigma d epsilon elastic is going to be greater than zero during that loading cycle, and if we have a work hardening material, d sigma d epsilon plastic is going to be greater than or equal to zero. Well then, d sigma d epsilon is going to be greater than zero. And in the case d sigma d epsilon p is greater than zero, we have a stable plastic material. basically has that rising slope in the tension test. We can extend this for multi-axial states of stress. In which case we can write this as d sigma ij d epsilon ij then using our index notation we have those terms uh, that product is going to be greater than zero and we can also say then that d sigma ij d epsilon ij plastic is going to be greater than or equal to zero with the equal to zero part if and only if d epsilon p is equal to zero Now this term right here then is known as Drucker's inequality for work hardening materials. And perfectly plastic materials, the case where it's equal to zero. Another interpretation of this inequality is that the plastic strain rate cannot oppose the stress rate for work hardening materials. They have to be in the same direction. They have to be both positive quantities. One can't be positive and the other negative. That has to be hardening or working positive slope with that material. So just a few, few words on that, just to say it again. Um, plastic strain net can cannot oppose the stress rate for work hardening materials. Now there is the case of work softening materials and we can talk about that as well but we're going to save that for a later time. It's not as typical for most engineering metals anyway to have a softening region. Um, so we're going to focus more on the work hardening materials at this point. Right, so that will lead us into our discussion on the maximum dissipation postulate, which is kind of a generalization of this Drucker's inequality. It doesn't have to be an infinitesimal change in stress. We can look at a finite change in stress in an infinitesimal uh, plastic strain. Uh, this is uh, the generalization of this to uh, work softening materials is uh, often referred to as Ilyushin's postulate 
And Lubliner himself has done a lot of work uh, looking at this maximum dissipation postulate. So if you if you put his name into Google, or if you put a maximum dissipation postulate into Google, you'll find a lot of papers that he's written. So I'll try to do uh, as best justice as I can to what he's written in his book. But um, the way that uh, we're going to look at this is we're going to start out with an initial elastic stress state. And uh, we're going to look at a multi-axial case. We'll call that initial stress state sigma star. Then we're going to do elastic loading to a point right on the yield surface. So we have impending plastic flow. And the state of stress that corresponds to that, we're just going to call that one sigma. And then we're going to apply a little bit of stress that causes a little bit of plastic strain. And then the work done per unit volume by the external agency. is sigma ij minus sigma ij star d epsilon ij plastic. And we're going to neglect the d sigma's contribution as compared to sigma minus sigma star. So Drucker's postulate implies that sigma ij minus sigma ij star d epsilon ijp is greater than or equal to zero. Here we have kind of a large increment instead of an infinitesimal change in stress. And it still makes sense when we are in the work hardening range, region. But this also works if we're looking at a work softening material. And the idea then is that we have some sort of stress on the softening part. That would be our stress sigma. And we're down here in the elastic range where we have our sigma star. And we're going from that stress level to that stress level. It's an increase in stress. We also have an increase in plastic strain over in this region. Our increment is greater than zero since we're in strain control and increasing the strain. Uh, so in this case, the sigma minus sigma star the epsilon p would be greater than zero or equal to zero. All right, so it works in both regions. All right, now here's where things kind of get interesting from a geometric perspective. We have the sigma ij minus sigma ij star. We have the scalar tensor product with the epsilon ijp. Those are two tensors. We usually think of those as three by three arrays. But there's another interpretation that we can take on this. Instead of arranging these components of these tensors in a matrix form, we can arrange them in a vector form and imagine that we have a scalar product of two vectors. And if we have a scalar product of two vectors, uh, we can think of our dot product. We have vector a and b, and we dot them. Then we know that it's the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times the cosine of the angle in between. And for a dot b to be greater than or equal to 0, then the angle between those two, 
theta has to be in between 90 to minus 90 degrees. From the perspective of being inside of a yield surface, I'm just going to draw some peculiar shaped yield surface here. I have to be a little bit careful. Let me straighten this up just a little bit. I don't want it to bow inward right now. We'll talk about that later. That if we we're on a point uh, on the yield surface, here's our sigma. And we're coming from an elastic stress state. Could be over here. There's my sigma star. Could be from over here. Here's a different sigma star. Could be from over here. Here's a different sigma star. In order to have this maximum dissipation postulate satisfied for every possibility. plastic strain has to be normal to the yield surface. So let's write that down. That's kind of the punchline for all of this. Okay, so any point inside is a, uh, there needs a star there, any point inside of this is an elastic uh, stress state. We're going to a stress state on the yield surface, and for any stress state, we want this equal inequality to hold. Sigma minus sigma star d epsilon ijp greater than or equal to zero. Uh, we can't be going in the opposite direction, otherwise we'd have a uh, angle theta that would be beyond this range of plus or minus 90 degrees. Now there's also another important implication of this, and that is um, that the yield surface has to be convex. For the work hardening material, and as we said, even work softening material. Let's give a counter example. If it were to be concave somewhere, maybe it would look like, uh, let's see, some shape like this. If we were on the yield surface with our point uh, sigma and we had a point inside the yield surface so that we had an elastic stress state, sigma star. Well, the difference between those, this would be sigma minus sigma star, dotted with d epsilon p. Well, then uh, we're not going to get something that's greater than or equal to zero. So this says that our yield surface, whatever shape it takes, has to be convex. Now there could be corners on it. 
the Tresca criterion we'll talk about. Or it could be like the von Mises, which is kind of smooth and has a nice defined surface. Uh, but it has to be uh, convex everywhere. And so that leads us into the normality flow rule. Plastic strain increments that are normal to the yield surface means that they are proportional to the gradient of the yield function. If we have a well-defined yield function, such as we've discussed previously with the von Mises yield criterion, then the plastic strain increments are going to be proportional to the gradient of that yield function. Any plastic strains that are proportional to this gradient of this yield function is called an associated flow rule. The plastic strain increments are derived from the plastic potential based on the yield function that you're using. Now, it's possible, I don't recommend it, but you can use a non-associated flow rule in which your plastic strain increments are not proportional to the yield function or the gradient of the yield function. That's called a non-associated flow rule. So let's say that this was um, plastic strain increments are proportional to some other term partial of g with respect to sigma ij and g is not equal to our yield function and that's a non-associated flow rule uh, now this I don't think was very well appreciated kind of early on in the uh, applications of the plasticity theories talking about the early mid 1900s I guess and you may find some situations where people used um, the von Mises yield criterion but they use plastic strain increments based on the Tresca criterion or vice versa uh, in my experience, I think you'd always want to use an associated flow rule. If you have yield surfaces that have corners where there's no distinctly defined normal, so over here, the surface might have a normal this way, and this surface might have a normal this way. Well, what you can do is your d epsilon ij plastic can be anywhere in the cone formed by these two. So it could be anywhere in here. Now, in a lot of uh, practical applications, since this is not uniquely defined, uh, what you can do is you can go in here and you can put a very small curve in here anyway. So even with dealing with the Tresca criterion, if you make this uh, a smooth curve from here to here, you can have uniquely defined normals. And that takes some of the, the ambiguity out of it, um, depending on what your, what your purpose is. Um, if you think that these plastic strain increments in the yield surface represent specific glide planes, and then you can have some sort of kinematic relationship that defines the glide plane along a certain path, and maybe that would more uniquely define the plastic strain increments.
my applications, I typically use a, a von Mises criterion or, or a Hill criterion, something that, that is uh, fairly smooth everywhere and has a unique uh, normal on, on every surface. And that kind of avoids some of these issues. But if you go to Etresca or some of these more sharply defined yield criteria, uh, then you may need to think about how you're going to define your plastic strains at those corners. All right, so that'll wrap up this lecture. The big takeaway from this then is the normality flow rule. If we can define our surface, our yield surface, by a functional form of stresses, and if we take a gradient of that, partial F, partial sigma ij, then the plastic strains, plastic strain increments, will point in that direction. It'll be proportional to that vector. Exactly the uh, amount of proportionality is something that we will uh, determine uh, based on some different situations and uh, uh, exactly uh, what our hardening characteristics are for our material.